Good morning, folks. This is Lecture 20 on March 23rd, 2023. So, uh, the agenda today is discussing the mode uh, summation method. And actually, this is something that you have seen in one way or other on Tuesday's lecture, okay? Uh, however, it's uh, kind of renamed and rebranded because there are certain aspects of it that I would like to emphasize on today. Now, after I do that, which is more or less review of uh, lecture on Tuesday, we will discuss how to do the forced uh, uh, undamped uh, response of two de degree of freedom system. What we did on Tuesday and the week before, when I was, when I, when I was not here, was a free vibration. Now, what we want to do, extend this concept of decoupling equations, uh, equations of motion, so that we can solve, solve uh, two, two degree of freedom system, uh, which are under force response, uh, force the loading. Okay. So, basically, it's an alternative expla explanation of what we did on Tuesday. Let me remind you that Given the mother of all equations for a linear system, uh, what we did, we found the natural frequencies. And for each of the natural frequencies, obviously we are here we are discussing two degree of freedom system. So find omega 1 and omega 2. These are the natural frequencies of the system. And for each one of them, patiently find the mode shapes, u1 and u2. And if you take this U1 and U2 and put it in the columns of a matrix, what you get is the modal matrix. So this is the mode shape associated with omega 1, and this is the mode shape associated with omega 2. Now, we found out that if you take the mass matrix, the original mass matrix, and pre-multiply it by transpose of this matrix P, modal matrix, and post multiplied by P, you actually get a two by two diagonal matrix. Now this M1 and M2 are not the same M1 and M2 because that's why I put a tilde on top of it to remind you that these are not the same as M1 and M2 of the original two by two system. Uh, in fact, M1 is just the mode shape transpose times M times u, u1 transpose mu. And this m2 tilde is u2 transpose m u2. These are just numbers. And these numbers are not necessarily the same as the original mass one and mass two that we have. Now, the same thing is gonna happen with the stiffness matrix. The good thing is that the stiffness matrix, which may not have been diagonal through this transformation, always becomes a diagonal matrix. And this is called, I put tildes here, uh, so to remind you that this is not the same as K1 that you had for the original system, and this is not the same K2. These are, in fact, these values. So this is called the, the modal stiffness matrix associated with mode one. Oh, I, don't, I didn't mean the stiffness matrix, the modal the, 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 the modal stiffness associated with mode one and the, uh, the modal mass associated with mode one and the same thing with the other one which are associated with mode two. Now, if you do this, in other words, you take the mother of all equation, which was mx dot, double dot, plus kx, pre-multiplied by P transpose and post-multiplied by P because of the transformation, because of that transformation, you actually get a decoupled system of differential equations. So this is a diagonal matrix, which is given here. This is a diagonal matrix, which is given here. So actually, if you write it line by line, you're gonna get two decoupled equations, the top equation, has nothing to do with the second equation, and the second one has nothing to do with the top one. Essentially, these are, in fact, they are single degree of freedom systems which resulted from this transformation. 
from the modal matrix. Now, we spent about eight weeks on these single degree of freedom systems, and uh, we found out that if you have an equation like that, you can actually solve it. Uh, the solution is going to be just a, an amplitude times sine of a frequency, which is going to be this equation, which is frequency one. And then there's a phase angle. These phase angles, the phase angle and the, the amplitude here depend on the initial condition. And the same thing with the second equation. So these things depend on initial conditions of the problem. In other words, when you have an equation given, given to us, we have x at time zero specified. So that gives you two conditions. And x dot at time zero specified, that gives you two more equations. So we have four equations. And these four unknowns come from those four equations. Now let's write this thing in the, in the expanded form. So we found Q1 and Q2, at least in theory we found it. It's right here and there. And to find the x, which is actually the variable that you're interested in, you have to multiply it by the matrix P. And if you do that, uh, you, can, you can view this. If you do this multiplication, you notice that it's actually this. Okay, it's actually this because u11 times d1 times that, okay, uh, plus u21 times this times that is going to be essentially coming from this column, this column, this column, multiplied by that row, and you're going to get this expression. Another, another, another way of writing this thing, another way of thinking about x bar equal to p, this is the p matrix, uh, times q is to think about it in this term. Now notice that this is the mode shape associated with the first frequency, first degree of freedom, and this is the mode shape associated with the second frequency. Okay, so this whole thing, we can write it like that. Mode shape times the modal coordinate, this is called modal coordinate, the whole thing, which is your Q1, and second mode shape times the modal coordinate, second modal coordinate, the whole thing, Q2. So it, obviously the same thing is written, but here it is as a sum to make it easier. So if you have n degrees of freedom, then there will be sum from 1 to n, ui, di, etc. However, uh, remember, these frequencies have to be calculated and the motifs have to be calculated. And for anything beyond 2 by 2, even 3 by 3, it becomes kind of intractable in principle. Now, these, remember I said that I, they come from initial conditions, okay? And uh, these are called modal coordinates. This whole thing is your QI, uh, which means Q1 and Q2, and I goes from 1 to 2, and these are called modal coordinates. These are the mode shape associated with mode I, and this is the frequency, natural frequency associated with mode I. In other words, this big box summarizes the whole thing. The total response is made of two pieces. In this case, it's a two degree of freedom made of two pieces. Mode shape times Q1. Now Q1 is called modal coordinate, and it depends obviously on the D1, omega 1, and phi 1, and the same thing down here. Okay, this is for mode 2. That's why this is called modal summation or mode summation method. Now, these DIs that you saw a minute ago here, are right there, the DI here, D1 and D2, D1 and D2, in general DI, uh, these are called modal participation factors. And it tells you how much mode 1, because the multiplier of mode of that, uh, of that sign term, basically, it tells you how much of that is actually important, is participating in, in, in the overall response. If di is very, very small, means that that particular mode, for example, if d2 is very, very small, it means that that particular mode actually does not participate much, and therefore one can probably ignore it, okay? So uh, anyway, uh, these are called modal participation factors, and they uh, represent how much of that mode is important. Now, let's do an example, example here. So we have, uh, in the past, we have done a quarter model representation of a car where we actually ignored the, the, mass, of, uh, the mass of the wheel. But here, we're going to include, include the mass of the wheel, or wheels, in this case, quarter model. 
and uh, therefore we have a situation like this is two degree of freedom system so uh, we can uh, this this uh, m1 this m1 is called the uh, the unsprung mass uh, sorry sprung mass and this uh, m2 is called unsprung mass okay so we can represent this thing physically or graphically like that but uh, it eff effectively it represents the mass of the car and the mass of the tire or tires okay the same thing with these stiffnesses uh, so uh, the, this represents the stiffness of the tire and this represents the basically stiffness that's coming from the uh, suspension of the car now the ergonomic damping here what you want to do is to look at the a motor superposition uh, approach and find for example the displacement of the the chassis uh, the chassis uh, x1 of t displacement of x as a function of time now the data that we have is given there okay so uh, let us go ahead and form uh, the mass matrix this is the stiffness matrix okay these are things that you should be able to do after uh, having done uh, two weeks of, uh, or two, two lectures actually, of a very simple, uh, a simple problem. This is a simple problem. And in order to find natural frequencies, you take a minus, right, this is called the characteristic equation. You take the characteristic equation, set it equal to zero. And uh, determinant of omega squared, we don't know what omega is, we have to find it, m plus k equal to zero. And this, in the long form, is gonna look like that. And uh, if you, it's a quadratic equation, actually it's a fourth degree polynomial, however, terms appear as omega four and omega squared. So essentially it's a two, uh, uh, quadratic equation. So you, you solve for the two frequencies and you're gonna get these things. Now patiently, you have to go and take this first frequency and find the mode associated with it. Now, uh, I, I'm not gonna do that because this has been done twice uh, uh, in lecture 18 and lecture 19, so uh, I will leave it to you to work it out. Uh, the second natural frequency is over here. You find patiently, go find the the uh, second second mode shape. Okay, that goes with this frequency, obviously. Uh, now, if you take these things and put it in the columns of this two by two matrix, you get the modal matrix. There we are. Modal matrix is a matrix that has the uh, the columns uh, the, uh, these columns has the mode shapes associated with the problem now if i multiply uh, if i create this product i told you in lecture uh, 19 that this is going to be a diagonal matrix and you can work it out okay and by the way if you take this 909 divided by uh, 2000 and take the square root of it you get exactly natural frequency and the same thing here if you take this take this uh, 22.1 e to the 9 divided by this uh, take the square root you get the natural frequency that doesn't surprise you because this business of this business of dec decoupling the equation essentially reduces uh, the system into two independent single degree of freedom system uh, and if you go to uh, for example, for the first uh, single degree of freedom system, the mass is 2000 and the stiffness is uh, 909. So if you take the 909 divided by 2000, take the square root, another square root of k over m, you get the frequency that we got. Now, there's something I want to show you here is that, in fact, if you, I wrote by m tilde and k tilde like that, as if these were zero. But if you, uh, for example, use, uh, you know, not the exact value for the modal shape, modal coordinates, these things, mode shapes, uh, for example, 0911, et cetera, four digits after the decimal point, you can, you're gonna get something like that. If you take seven digits after the decimal point, uh, the numbers are gonna, some numbers are gonna look different. Because these, notice that these two are the same and um, uh, these two are the same and the same thing with the stiffnesses 909 and 909 and this and that are the same but these off diagonal terms are different so you might say wait a minute this is very insensitive so it depends uh, how many uh, how many uh, decimals i take Th that is true however remember 
for all practical purposes, this number is zero compared to the off-diagonal terms, or this number is zero compared to the off-diagonal term. So yes, the number of digits affect this. However, for all practical purposes, these off-diagonal terms are zero. This is why I literally replaced them with zero up there. Okay, now, remember, to solve the problem, you were given initial conditions. If you go back to the slide, uh, I think it was slide seven or six, it tells you that solve the problem under these initial conditions. In other words, x of zero is given to you, x dot of zero is given to you. Now, since I'm solving equation in terms of q's, okay, uh, I need q at zero and q dot at zero, but that's very simple because it all comes from this transformation. In other words, if you, if you, if you wrote this thing, if you wrote this thing as uh, q equal to p inverse of x and you plug in t equal to zero on both sides, you're going to get q of zero. And if you differentiate this thing and plug in t equal to zero, you get this. In other words, uh, based, on my, uh, based on my matrix p, I took only four digits here for convenience, uh, the inverse of that is given there. And if you, and if you multiply p inverse by these initial conditions that were given now i've not written it here but x of zero is given x dot of zero is given x dot of zero i believe it was zero itself so right there x dot of zero zero so you're going to get initial conditions that you want to solve the problem q of zero and q dot of zero so you have uh, two decouple first uh, single single degree of freedom system with initial condition. If you look at the top line equation, initial conditions, this is the kind of thing that we did back in week uh, week uh, week two, okay, or week three, uh, week two, yeah, we did in week two. Single degree of rigid system with a zero right outside. In other words, free vibration, undamped free vibration, subject to initial condition, we did it. And this is a template from back then. In other words, if you go back to the Week two, you see that these things popped up there. In other words, the solution actually can be worked out. Now, here I have an A, or at least back then, we had an A and five. But of course, here, uh, this is not A. This is D in general, or D1 and phi1, and D2 and phi2. So uh, it's, it's the same thing. So let's go ahead. So if, if you use, uh, if you use these, this template from Week, week two, then these are the information, you plug it in, you're gonna get that. Okay, now remember, this means 10 to the minus five, by the way, it's not negative five, it's not e minus five, it's 2.277 e to the minus five, which means 10 to the minus, not minus five. Uh, now, uh, yeah, so you're gonna get, uh, you're gonna get this, and uh, uh, if you want the actual physical coordinate, you have to multiply q by p. So we got the q's right there. You multiply by the matrix p, modal matrix, and we're going to get our solution for x1 and x2, the displacement of the chassis of the car and the displacement of the, the wheel. Okay, and they're not the same. You can see that. Uh, incidentally, because the phase angle is pi over 2 for both cases, where was it here? Uh, for both cases, uh, uh, yeah, right, right there. I have replaced sine of this plus pi over two with cosine of it, and the plot of x one, the, the, the chassis of the car, uh, as a function of time is given here. Now remember, these things are uh, uh, millimeters, right? These are millimeters. Okay, that's good. So uh, one last thing before we move on to the rest of the presentation, let me write this thing in a, in a, in a look at it a different way. Although this is exactly what I did for you in the previous slide, but you can also view this thing as this column times Q1 plus the second column times Q2. And that's where we can see that this is exactly what we call mode summation method. Mode summation method. Mode one, mode two. Okay? All right. So, uh, we're now going to look at the case where the right hand side is not zero. So let me take a, a quick uh, quick break here.
Okay, so uh, the uh, on damp system, we are still looking at the on damp situation uh, of, a, of, a, of a two degree of freedom system, in general, multi degree of freedom system, which is under a force loading, is given by this equation, which I keep referring to as the mother of all equations. Okay, now uh, if you write this thing for the uh, two by two matrices, mass matrix looking like this. Now remember, uh, in stiffness matrix like like so, and the force vector as a vector of two component. Uh, before I move any further, I want to remind you that all the mass matrices that we have used in the uh, in the last two weeks after we started the multi degree freedom system were diagonal. So I assume that my mass matrices are diagonal. That may not be the case, depending on the choice of the coordinate x1 and x2 that you have. However, you will see that irrespective of that, when you use modal coordinates, in other words, we do that transformation going from x to p, then the, the resulting mass matrix and stiffness matrix will both be diagonal. But as it is, the mass matrix, uh, the mass matrix is... Uh, As it is, the mass matrix is uh, is diagonal to begin with, and be that's because of the the way we have we have handled the course so far in in this course. Okay, now uh, so this is the long version of that. Uh, uh, this is the long version of the, what you see on the top. Now through this modal matrix, in other words, after you after you find the natural frequencies, the two natural frequencies and the two mode shapes associated with them. If you take those mode shapes and you put them in the column, in the column of the matrix P, you get the modal, uh, modal, modal uh, matrix. Okay. Now, uh, we get rid of X through this change of variable, and we pre-multiply by B transpose. We know what's going to happen. We're going to get this, which is going to be diagonal matrix and that which is also going to be diagonal matrix so we call that thing m tilde and we call this thing k tilde these are different from the m and k it's something that you have to work out and the right hand side is no longer this f it is p transpose of f so just be aware of the fact that this right hand side is also different from the original system okay so that's what you've got. However, as I pointed out, the whole idea behind this uh, change of uh, change of coordinates is that mass matrix becomes diagonal, stiffness matrix becomes diagonal, and the right hand side, of course, is the right hand side. Uh, when and and the, I want to remind you what this m1 hat m1 tilde was. It was u1 transpose m u1, etc. This is the stuff that we did on Tuesday's lecture, lecture 19, okay? Now, also, as a, as a, as a, as a point of reference, uh, notice that uh, this vector, this vector, which was obtained by taking the original vector and pre-multiplied by P, P transpose, can be written like so. The first column of the P matrix dotted with the original F vector, and the second column of the P matrix, modal matrix, dotted with the original F vector, force vector. You can write it like that, or if you don't like this dot, you can write it as U1 transpose F transpose, uh, FT, and U2 transpose FT. So it's just a matter of shape, uh, taste, whether you want to use the dot or whether you want to use, uh, as look at it as the multiplication on the left by the transpose of the, of, of the first column etc now let's move on so notice that these are two independent single degree of freedom system where decoupled from each other where the right hand side is no longer zero it's a function function of time and we have done this thing in the you know week three of the course let's do an example here so suppose we have a, a beam like that, which is simply supported at the two end, and on it there is perhaps a, 
uh, perhaps a, uh, a fan or a, a compressor, which is turning at a given RPM, it has a certain, it obviously exerts because of the, you know, inherent, uh, in, inherent uh, uh, unbalance, it, it applies a sinusoidal uh, load to the, the mass M1. Okay, and mass M1 is, think about it as a fan or the fan plus the mass of the beam in, you know, uh, we know how to do problems like this in, uh, uh, from, from the first three or four weeks of the course. Okay, now attached to the bottom is another mass and that is uh, through, through a spring. Now stuff like this is uh, uh, very, has a very practical use and this is called the vibration absorber. So instead of potentially this beam or that motor to wild, to, to oscillate up and down widely if it was without any attachment, what we do is we make it a, a two degree of freedom system by adding a spring and a mass here. Uh, the mass, this mass is usually much smaller than that. So that instead of this guy, the motor running uh, or the motor uh, uh, oscillating violently because of perhaps the, the speed of the, the fan being close to the, uh, to the natural frequency of the beam, uh, beam uh, what happens is that it's this mass uh, absorbs that energy and starts vibrating very violently as opposed to the actual structure, okay? We will talk about this thing next Thursday in lecture, that'll be lecture, I believe, 22, where we talk about vibration absorbers. This is the data that we're gonna be using. And uh, this data is uh, precisely what I did in the earlier, uh, earlier data, earlier example. Remember the, 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 the car, et cetera, it had, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it had these numbers because I'm too lazy. I don't want to go and find the natural frequencies and the, the modes and things like that for a whole block of new numbers. Okay. So uh, this kind of a thing is actually used really in a very practical way. Here is a, a, a skyscraper in Taipei. This is actual uh, you know, 70, 80 story building tall, uh, stories high. And on the very top, there is a mass that's dangling for three or four floors. The whole idea is that if there is an earthquake and the beam, uh, the, the, the building tries to vi vibrate, oscillate back and forth violently or uh, oscillate, it's this mass that we do the oscillation for it. So this is a vibration absorber. And here at the scale, you can see that two people and there is that big blob of mass that's hanging there. So it is very common. Now here is the stuff that we did. These are the same numbers, as I said, that we used in the earlier example with the, 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 the quarter model of the car. And this is the load, which is being applied to the mass one. That's why the second component is zero. And this is the driving frequency, omega is the driving frequency, which I believe is one. Uh, we found the natural frequency, first natural frequency and the first mode, second natural frequency and the second mode put it in the matrix P to get the modal, modal matrix. And we, if you do this multiplication, P transpose MP, it will be diagonal, right, right there. And uh, K, uh, P transpose KP is also diagonal. Remember, M is called the, the, uh, the modal mass matrix, and this K is called the modal stiffness matrix, the original M and P, these are not modal, these are not called modal, these are mass matrix, stiffness matrix. Now, once again, I, want, I, I remind you what I, what I told you before, if you take the square root of K over M, you get the first natural frequency. If you take the square root of this K over this M, because this is for the second equation, you get the second natural frequency. Now, as far as the F tilde is concerned, F tilde is concerned, well, uh, we have no choice. We just have to pre-multiply it by P transpose and see what we get. So if you take this matrix, transpose it, and multiply it by that F, you're gonna get exactly what you see over there. And this is a template from week three, week three of the course. So it really tells you what the solution to uh, the equation is when the right-hand side is not zero, See, 
the right hand side is not zero but it is the forcing term that's given to you here uh something like that so this is from lecture nine now uh, we're going to use these you have to know this stuff uh, you have to know everything about single degree of freedom system for the final exam you know that and we're going to as you can see we need it to do multi degree of freedom system if you do this decoupling uh, approach now what, what i have here is the template for you so if you look at this is the template from that lecture nine uh, this is the steady state response x is that the amplitude is this the amplitude of the vibration of that single degree of freedom system is this uh, there's no damping theta is zero okay and uh, yeah so for our problem first mode first equation it was all decoupled from the second equation so this is what you got you have q1 you have m1 tilde k1 tilde right hand side whatever it happens to be in this particular problem it came out to be 100 cosine of omega t and uh, there is your amplitude now i call this thing q instead of x because we're going into the you know we're using the q's instead of the x's instead of x1 x2 we're using the q1 and q2 that's why i call the amplitude instead of x this and just literally write it down so for our particular problem this is for the template this is for the notation that we have here ours can be q1 or it can be q2 uh, here is for q1 and we wrote these coefficients we know exactly what these things are we just work it out there's a solution q1 and for this is for the second mode second equation decoupled completely from the one above it which is the first equation and just plug in your these are the coefficients plug in the numbers and you're going to get the solution right there now i also want to remind you that the amplitude of a single degree of freedom system under a sinusoidal load which is exactly what they have here is shoots to infinity in the absence of damping so if you look at Q1, it's exactly a single degree of freedom system under a sinusoidal load without any damping. That's why it shoots to infinity at this natural frequency for mode one. And the same thing happened for mode two. That's why we have amplitude of mode two at the second natural frequency, uh, which is 14 point something. Uh, this, this, this is pointing to that. Oops pointing to that peak okay this 14 point something is a little bit to the left of 15 i've drawn it a lot more to the left of 15 because i wanted to otherwise you won't be you won't be able to do to see it and once again the solution came out to be like that and it's plotted x1 of t is plotted x2 of t is plotted and this is all no damping so it goes vibrate up and up and down uh, in a in a sinusoidal manner without losing the amplitude now before we stop this lecture there's a couple of things i want to tell you two degrees of freedom system that we have done they don't always have to be translation i mean we have for convenience the problem that we have done were two masses translating but here is a situation for example where we have a cart here which is translating back and forth vibrating back and forth and the, the ball on it rolls up and down okay let's say that uh, uh, you see in general in general if uh, uh, if there is uh, no slipping involved here if there is no slipping involved here these two are uh, are related right but in general they don't have to be uh, you know, that, that condition now here's another situation uh, this also is a two degree of freedom system because this mass can vibrate in the x direction and y direction or x1 and x2 so this is a two degree of freedom system but we're not looking for two masses you know uh, because uh, as i said most of the problem that we have done we have two masses and stuff like that or here is the situation where these two are uh, vibrating back and forth okay and uh, the, 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 the rotational motion and these are degrees of freedom theta one and theta two 
or a block which is going uh, horizontally, vibrating horizontally, attached to it is a pendulum which actually can swing up and down. So these are not related, okay? This displacement X and theta, they are not related. If they are not related, means that, uh, uh, you know, there is uh, there's a slip there, a slip there, okay? So, uh, now, uh, here is a situation for an airfoil. Uh, this is the, the example that we did in uh, lecture 19. You may want to go back to it. This is a, a bounce and pitch model of a car. So the, let's do a quick review here. The mother of all two degree of freedom systems is linear system is this. If there is no right hand side, there is no uh, forcing, forcing function, okay? And to get the natural frequencies, this is what you need to do. This is called the characteristic equation. And what we do is once we, once we uh, uh, find the natural frequencies and the mode, in the case of 2DOF, two frequencies and two mode, you put in the modal, ma modal matrix and do this change of variable, and you get the mother of all equation where the equations have been decoupled, okay? No damping, you can see that. And uh, basically, we have two single degree of freedom system, and everything that goes with it in the first, I don't know, 10 weeks of the course, nine weeks of the course, you have to know that. Okay. And that is it. So uh, some of you will see this afternoon in the tutorial. If not, uh, I will see you next week. Good luck. Have a good weekend.